What is a submarine? A submarine is a steel tube in which we put 3,000 pound hydraulic pipes, 4,500 pounds per square inch high pressure air, everywhere you can reach. We've got 450 volt AC power, 250 volt DC power. We have fans and pumps. We arm it with the weapons of almost unimaginable destructive power. We propel it with a nuclear reactor, and then we take it out and intentionally sink it in salt water. That's not inherently safe. The latest Los Angeles-class fast attack submarine is limited in its capability by only one thing, how much food she can carry. Usually, it's 60 days' supplies for her crew of almost 150. Getting them on board is a tricky maneuver. Everything that enters the submarine goes through a narrow hatch, food, men, and weapons. Below is a sealed world of work, drills, sleep, and more work in a cramped and sunless environment. The Topeka is preparing to go out on patrol. Only a handful of people know where she's going and for how long. She may be gone 12 hours or six months, patrolling close to Russia or lurking in the Red Sea. This is the world of the submariner regardless of his nationality. The former Soviet Union still has the largest submarine fleet in the world, though much of it consists of aging diesel electrics, like this Foxtrot. She is nearing the end of her useful life. Nonetheless, this patrol could take her as far as the Mediterranean, and for six months. Returning from two months' sea trials in the Atlantic is Her Majesty's submarine, Unseen. She is also a diesel electric, and is the Royal Navy's most modern non-nuclear submarine. Submarines have always inspired both fascination and fear. Their movements remain closely guarded secrets, and the lives of the men aboard a mystery. They all belong to a closed society, members of an exclusively male club. Separation is a fact of life shared by all submariners and their families. Once a man goes on patrol, he may as well be on the moon. It's a continual cycle of separation and reunion. Some say it's like a divorce every six months. Others, that it's a honeymoon. Not married myself, but um, my views on the Navy itself, as far as marriage is concerned, and I'm going to sea, I think it does put a lot of uh, pressure on the, on the marriage. When a ship goes to sea, like the ones out here, the most I spend at sea, actually at sea, maybe five or six days before they pull into a port. We go out, we might spend six to eight weeks at sea. 
The only people you see are the people you see around you now. That's it all the time. You can't contact your family, you can't write to them. <laughs> it must be there. <laughs> hard to leave the family, hard to leave the children. I have two little ones, a one-year-old and a two-year-old. They don't really understand six months, but um, even when I'm only gone for a week, they know when I'm gone for a few days and they start asking mom, where's daddy, and that sort of thing. Standing in the front window, where's daddy, when's he coming home, why's daddy not here for dinner. I feel kind of sad, because you see him for a while and then he takes off, and then he comes back and then he takes off. I like it when he comes back. And I don't like it when he leaves. When his boat moves away from the dock, a submariner enters a world which he cannot share with anyone except those around him. By tradition, submarine service is the most secretive among the military in any country. Once the Topeka reaches deep water off San Diego, she will dive, entering her true element. The first dive was frightening. I mean, in the school, they tell you how the submarine works, they put together what happens when you dive. Well, I actually stood there, and the aft, aft went down first of all. And I was sat in the control and thinking, well, this is wrong, I'm going down backwards. <laughs> and the back goes down, the front goes down, you then actually dive. Officer of the deck, when you're steady on course, merge the ship. When I'm steady on course, merge the ship, aye, sir. Operating a submarine requires precision teamwork. The captain's orders are repeated and relayed several times before being carried out. It's part of a system of multiple checks designed to eliminate the possibility of error. Diving officer, submerge the ship to 150 feet. Submerge the ship to 150 feet, aye, sir. Driving officer, watch two bullets, huh? Dive! Dive! To submerge his ship, a submariner must do what every surface sailor dreads, take water on board. Ballast tanks are flooded for extra weight, and diving planes steer the boat below. Achieving what's called neutral buoyancy is a fine balance between submerging and sinking. Next wash. Next wash, aye, sir. Full diving the bow plane. Establish a three degree down bubble. 7-2. Technically, it would be possible to automate many of these functions. But when a submarine operates as deep as 1,500 feet, a minor mechanical problem could push it to crushing depth. Though quicker to identify emergencies, computers cannot combat them. As in the cockpit of an aircraft, there is no room for mistakes. Seeing the Foxtrot crew take her down, you could be forgiven for thinking you were watching a World War II movie. But once again, rigorous teamwork is everything. More than in any other branch of naval service, each man relies absolutely on his crewmate to do his job correctly. Submariners of all navies know their lives depend on each other. Whoever else may be friend or foe, they share a common enemy. The submariner has only one enemy, and that's all around him. 
the immensely powerful and utterly implacable sea. The United States Navy suffers a tragic disaster. A drama of sorrow is written when the submarine squalus plunges to the bottom of the sea off the North Atlantic Historically, coast. submarining has proved a dangerous business, reflected in the tradition of hazardous duty pay. Even peacetime brings its own disasters, as in the case of the squalus. And the prospect of rescue remains uncertain. In most of the waters of the world, you can't recover a submarine. As one admiral said, the only point in locating a wreck is to know where to send the flowers. More air is forced into the pontoon. Something's wrong. The second pontoon has broken loose. The churning water is a bad sign, and the fears of the rescue workers prove well-founded as the squalus breaks water momentarily, only to slip silently back to its ocean bed too. The, the safety record of our submarines is not perfect. In particular, we have lost two nuclear submarines over the course of the program, the uh, Thresher in 1963 and the Scorpion in 1968 were very significant events in our program. It was in April of 1963 that the Thresher made her last dive and became the watery tomb for a crew of 129 men. 8, the Thresher was the deepest diving combat submarine in the world. Her loss, caused by flooding and a reactor shutdown, was a tragic reminder that submarines operate alone in an environment as unforgiving as space. There is no margin for mistakes in a submarine. You're either alive or dead. Officer of the deck, reverse course to the right using a 25 degree rudder angle. Reverse course to the right using a 25 degree rudder angle, I sir. Helm right, 25 degrees rudder. 25 degrees rudder, helm I sir. Steady course, 180. Steady course, 180, helm I. I'll stack my rudders right, 25 degrees, sir. Very well, Helm. Commander Jablonski is putting Topeka through her paces. Usually, he warns the crew but not this time. Among other things, it's a good check to see if everything's stowed correctly. If you're being chased, the last thing you want is a tin of baked beans banging against the hull and giving your position away. They call it angles and dangles. To this day, the U.S. Navy will only admit to speeds in excess of 20 knots. But it's accepted that boats like the Topeka are capable of nearly twice this speed, almost 50 miles per hour submerged. In the underwater games of tag played between the superpowers, speed and maneuverability are essential ingredients, vital for outrunning your opponent and hopefully even his torpedoes. Lost maneuvering, make normal two thirds turns. Make normal two thirds turns, all right. Now left 15 degrees rudder, steady course north. Left 15 degrees rudder, steady course north. When you go on the score. Petty Officer Shaw is a nuclear engineer. His workspace is aft of the crew's mess and occupies almost half of the boat. It's a classified area where no cameras are allowed. Beyond this door is the heart of the Topeka, the nuclear reactor. Highly radioactive uranium generates intense heat, which superheats water in a separate loop of pipes to produce steam. 
This drives a turbine to create electricity, which in turn powers the propeller. Although nuclear safety is taken very seriously, there's a friendly rivalry about the pros and cons of working on nuclear as opposed to diesel electric boats. They call us nuke flukes. We call them diesel weeds just because of the smell and whatever you get from them. And they come alongside. Yeah, we're, we're the real submariners. I mean, as you can we're see like over there, we, we were the, the forerunners of the submarines. And then these like just come along and take all the, uh, take all the limelight, so to speak, you know. <laughs> The thing is, they, they call themselves uh, proper submariners, and these diesel boats in the background, they spend most of the time on the surface. So, um, you know, I rest my case. They're dependent <laughs> on the surface. Nuclear boats make our own yeah, air, but our own water. We don't need the surface at all. Once when we dive, we stay dived for as long as the food lasts. That's the only limit to how long you stay dived, your food. Yeah, but I don't turn off the lights and glow in the dark, do I? <laughs> you know, which is, which is what's going to happen with you. I mean, you're that close to a nuclear reactor, I mean, you know. When I started this, I had no idea what I was getting into. I had the same ideas about glowing people and material and all that stuff. That's really not how it is at all. It's very safe. Um, every person in the engineering department, in fact, everyone on the boat, on the entire submarine, wears uh, dosimetry. It measures the doses of uh, radiation that they get. Um, mine is something like this right here. It's a small thing I wear on my belt, and it measures the amount of gamma neutron radiation I get. The U.S. Navy is intensely sensitive to public perceptions of nuclear power and the safety of its men. But unanswered questions remain about the effects of exposure and the potential danger of nuclear submarines in heavily populated ports. Even the welfare of civilian refit workers is now a matter for debate. Safety is the biggest aspect. Safety is everything. And the entire boat is designed to keep everything in the boat if anything happened. Russian nuclear submarines have a poor safety record, despite the claims of their designers. You ask me my assessment of the radiation hazard on board this boat. I tell you, in fact, that, strange as it may seem, the level of radiation on board nuclear-powered submarines is lower than what you and I are exposed to when we walk around the city. All submarines are designed as weapons of war. Once underway, the rhythm of the machine takes over, whether it's an antiquated diesel electric like this or a modern nuclear boat. Priority is given to the propulsion and weapon systems. On a deck built for missile tubes, living quarters must be crammed into the spaces left over. A submariner's life is unique in the military. Unlike the aviator or the tank driver, he doesn't park his weapon at the end of the day. He lives inside the machine. They used to call them sewer pipe sailors. But nowadays, atmosphere control is rigorous, apart from indulging smokers. Aerosols, luminous watches, and even boot polish are forbidden lest they contaminate the closed environment. Fresh oxygen and water are made from the sea. Five more! They say the food is the best in the service, but unlike the Royal Navy, no alcohol is allowed on board. Enlisted men eat the same as the officers, but there's a chow line rather than silver service. Trash must be compacted and dumped into the sea, heavily weighted so as not to betray your position. Underway, distinction between night and day quickly disappears. Your time is broken into watches. Six hours on, six hours off. Yeah, Rick, Rick, it's time to get up and go on watch, man. Weekends become a thing of the past. The routine is relentless. Yeah, damn. Hmm. Yeah, it's five o'clock. It's time to get up. Your bunk's up really your only place right. that, that's yours. And we, we have to do things to kind of keep our morale up. A lot of guys bring personalized sheets when they go to sea. Uh, I've seen Snoopy sheets. I've seen sheets with hearts on them. And I even seen one guy where a guy had a computer image, of a full-length computer image of his wife on the sheet, so. Uh, 
uh, there's very little privacy on board. Okay. There's, in fact, there's, in fact, there's, there's no, well, no, well, you do have only, some, you have your rack. Yeah, it's, that's the only place on board that you can really, you know, go and get your thoughts together if you've had a really stressed out day. You just have to jump in it and close the curtain. And that's all you got as far as privacy. Yep, that's it. Uh, the rest of it is share. And share there. alike. Share alike, there you go. <laughs> I got some of my rack. It probably takes a special type of bloke to serve in submarines. Um, not all of us are volunteers, however, but there are very few people, in fact, I can only think of two or three, who have not enjoyed the comradeship and the closeness and the sort of interdependence that you have in a submarine, which is a, uh, a peculiar characteristic of submarines. You are quite literally living in each other's pockets. You do get close, uh, I mean, friendship-wise. Yeah, <laughs> darling. <laughs> do uh, build, a, I think, a sort of special uh, friendships, you know, that uh, you wouldn't sort of get outside the navy uh, on a submarine. You live in like such confined spaces and whatnot, and because you all eat together, you literally sleep on top of one another, which not, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you sort of, not you know, course, it's uh, oh, well, you go out drinking together when you arrive at a port and whatnot. So you sort of like. Buddies, as I say, all buddies in boats, as they say. It's very close on board, but when you go on long patrols, the tension it can get a bit too much at times. If you need to get away from someone, you've got nowhere to run. You're on board, you're stuck there, you can't leave. It takes a special kind of person to be able to handle the stress at times. You can't handle the stress, you can't live on board. I don't know about her, man. I heard, I heard a few things about her. Everybody knows her. Ah, well, how's her attitude? She got a nice attitude. Got yeah, I me. Mean, she's got a good personality. It's fun party with it. It's just like a big family when we're underway. Everyone's really tight. Yeah, the way you talk to people, the way you touch people. I mean, I think everybody here is really secure with themselves where they can do things like this underway in this kind of environment. But in public, it wouldn't be acceptable. The engineers, or nukes, joke that the torpedo man's job is to protect their reactor. Torpedo men, or coners, call the nukes their chauffeurs. Either way, the torpedo is central to the hunter killer's lethal anti submarine role. guided to its target by 20,000 yards of wire. At a maximum speed of 55 miles an hour, the advanced capability version is fast enough to catch the swiftest Russian submarine. Topeka also carries Tomahawk cruise missiles, demonstrated with such ferocity during the Gulf War by her sister submarines. Tubes loaded, the Topeka is ready for action. Well, there's very little difference between a submarine operating in peacetime and in wartime as far as the submarine is concerned. Uh, we are going out and we are covert. Uh, we are doing the same type of missions. Uh, we do everything up to the point of actually firing our weapons. And, and that is one of the reasons why our readiness is so high is that when we go into an area we're not detected uh, no one knows we're there so we can conduct our operation just as if we had a wartime mission in that area now this is the captain our situation right now is that we are moving into a area where there's been hostile submarine activity uh, we've received authorization to attack any hostile submarines, and we're conducting a sonar search for those contacts now. Carry on. That sound is the sound of the 
water running past our hydrophones that we use for underwater communication, but we can also hear other sounds in the water. And we're listening for close contacts. You would hear their screw blade noise coming in that coming through that speaker. A fast attack submarine is always only minutes away from responding to or initiating aggression. At the same time, she might spy on enemy maneuvers or intercept their underwater communication systems. Essential to all this is stealth, remaining undetected. It requires a state of constant alert. Commander Jablonski's first priority in wartime would be destruction of enemy boomers before they could launch their nuclear missiles. This might involve intricate maneuvers under the polar ice cap, traditional territory for Russian submarines. Ballistic missile submarines, like the Typhoon, operate to a different rhythm. Much of their time is spent simply hiding. Like cosmonauts aboard an orbiting space station, their crews live a life of virtual suspended animation. But not even Jules Verne pictured life like this at the bottom of the sea. As the world's biggest submarine, the Typhoon deserves the traditional nickname of the floating hotel. In its atmosphere of a comfortable, if slightly dated, health club, it's easy to forget its deadly purpose. It's one way of maintaining crew morale, despite very low pay, uncertainty about the future, and poor conditions at home. Despite all his responsibility, even Captain Zhigulyov earns only a few dollars a month. And then there's the traditional fringe benefit of the nuclear submariner. Russia may be finding it hard to feed its civilian population, but it clearly attaches importance to taking care of the submarine force. Little things are important out there. The cooks burn chow, the whole crew gets pissed. Can't show the movie when you want to. Upsets people. We mess with each other a lot. We'll know something agitates a guy, so we'll, we'll do that to agitate him just to get to him. In those last three or four weeks of patrol, though, you, you can tell everybody's ready to get mm -hmm. home because everybody's like at each other's throat. Going, oh, okay, yeah, it okay, goes. Right, just yeah. just get out of my face. Starts out, everyone's in a pretty good mood and, <laughs> and, and happy and having a lot of fun. And, you know, towards the end of patrol, uh, we tend to get pretty uptight with each other. We do little things that are funny to us, might not be funny to other people. We freeze people's shoes and steal their pillow and. Sounds like kid stuff, but it breaks the boredom out there. The isolation is intense. You can't call home or even write a letter. But eight times each patrol, the Navy allows you a message from home. Whatever news can be squeezed into 50 words. They call them family grams. I know you'll think I'm crazy but I had to ring home just to hear your voice on the answering machine. It made me cry. Can't wait to see you. All my love, Patty. Family grams are really important once we get underway and on toward the end of patrol, because they got, you know, you just, 
got to have something to keep the guys up and keep them going. And it, the morale factor on a family gram is, is, is the biggie on the boat. One of the joys of being a radioman is after watch. They get to walk through the ship, and you've got a whole stack of family grams in your hand. People are sitting there going, have I got a gram? Have I got a gram? Now, what's kind of bad is when you have to give them a gram for their mom, right? Oh, my mom? <laughs> All right. But, you know, my wife, yes. Or you find out that their kids are doing great in basketball. Yes, yes, yes. So you can, it, it's a good feeling. It's a great, and it's sort of like a mail call in the old movies. Mail call. In the confinement and isolation, boredom can become a professional hazard. I think anyone has boredom with their job sometimes, but there's, you can be sitting on watch, and then you pick the sonarmen pick up a contact, and what was a boring midwatch, now you're chasing somebody. All right, attention and control. We have what's been classified as a hostile submarine. Sierra 34 now bears 098. The contact is drawn to the right. My intention is to move around behind them and get in position to attack them with a the Mark 48 torpedo. Carry on. Command battle station. We operate in realistic scenarios. You don't think about it a lot, but it, in the back of your mind, you know that you know your profession, if called upon, is to go out there and uh, destroy the enemy, and we're ready to do that. Film steady course 170. Steady course 170. 39 years old. Commander Edward Jablonski controls a billion-dollar weapon system. It's a responsibility he relishes. It's a very uh, challenging time, and, and uh, it gets your heart pumping because you know that you're in a position where if you make a mistake, uh, you have the potential to, uh, to give away your position. Weapons officer, tube three will be the first tube, uh, tube four will be the backup tube. Tube three, first tube, tube four, backup tube, aye, sir. Our mission is to go in there and destroy specific targets, whether it's with our torpedoes or with our cruise missiles, and but whether we carry nuclear weapons or not is not something that, you know, can be discussed at the unclassified level. So we'll leave the question at that. It's a violent profession if you look at it, you know, at the fundamental level, but you're not going to deter aggression or beat your enemy without some destruction. Stand by. Shoot. Hit her course, 180. Very well, weapon. Shot looks good on plot. Very well, plot. Officer deck. Secure from battle stations. Secure from battle stations, aye. Keep watch on the 1FC secure battle stations. Secure battle stations. All stations con slowing. We're seeing 150 feet. Preparation come to periscope depth. Gotcha. Well, this is clearly the best submarine in the world. I mean, there is there is no comparison. As far as I'm concerned, there's no other platform that uh, I would want to be on if, if the shooting started. We could take on and defeat anything that's out there. Officer, the deck, proceed to periscope depth. For months on end, the captain alone will decide on the submarine's operations, reporting his results only on return to base. Constant drilling, like this anti-submarine exercise, keeps the edge on his men during the long periods of confinement. Tough, ruthless training isn't just to gain professionalism. It's because there's another kind of pressure. It's not just the sea that exerts pressure. It's the circumstances, the psychological pressure. 
Aboard the submarine Haddock, the Navy's Operation Hideout draws to a close after two months of being sealed below decks for the 23-man volunteer crew. It's been a test of human fitness over prolonged periods of submerged conditions, and the crew's reactions will largely determine the human factor in the Navy's first atomic submarine, designed to stay under indefinitely. What's the first thing these bearded sea dogs wanted to do after 60 days of confinement? Why, shave with fresh, hot water. Admiral Rickover said, we don't know if we have any problems aboard our submarines because we don't send psychiatrists out on them. And uh, I rather endorse that. The atomic submarine Nautilus cruised under the Arctic ice and the North Pole itself, an historic underwater voyage from Hawaii to England. We had a psychiatrist, for example, on board the Nautilus when it went under the pole. And uh, looking for the stresses of the people, the stresses aren't there. The people aren't stressed in submarine operations. If they are, they won't get in them or they'll get out of them. Uh, the only person stressed on Nautilus was a psychiatrist because the crew teased him so much. One place I went when I was on uh, one submarine, we had very limited amount of water underneath us and we had very limited amount of water above us because of the polar ice. And the job you did then was very, very important. And one mistake and everything could be gone. You either hit the bottom or you hit the ice. So it's stressful being out there all by yourself. The pressure of separation contributes to the highest divorce rate in the armed services. One of the bad things about uh, submarining in general is usually a run, each run you can, you're going to wind up with maybe uh, two to three divorces. After a while of reading the same grams over and over again, you can see when there's a problem, the family grams, they lose the warmth. After a while of reading them, you kind of sit there and you're, you know, don't really want to give the guy the gram. With bad news, you know, most of the time it's better if you don't hear about it because there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you're still going to be out there on patrol. You're going to be uh, doing your job. And if you don't know about it, you're better off, you know, until you get back. The people who survive that pressure and perform really well are those who've had the toughest training. Sometimes people say, OK, how do they release that pressure? Well, I can tell you the best way by far. It's sex. Wives and girlfriends are really crucial to submariners. Now for a more intimate and personal welcome from wives and children, families and friends. A scene in which America joins while echoing the Navy's traditional words of praise, well done, very well done. Some of the wives get awful lonely and they want to let their husbands know that they're lonely. So they'll sit there and uh, you'll get some spicy family grams and not, not too to the point of being vulgar, but slightly risque. Something like, I can't wait to wrap my loving arms and legs around you, or something to that effect. Or, um, can't wait for you to bring home the, you can have a special dinner ready for you. Uh, can't wait for you to bring home the meat, you know, things to that effect. And those kind of grams will chop out the names so that no one gets embarrassed to protect the innocent or guilty or whatever. And uh, those become the family grams of the week. We post those down on the mess deck so everybody can get a laugh out of them. If it weren't for the grams, sometimes we'd go insane. Because everybody has to know that, you know, even though this is an adventure, right, we still got a home, too. And it's, you know, we really miss our families a lot. Typically, this is the hardest part of a submarine family's life. The Georgia is preparing to depart on patrol today. When they say goodbye in a couple of hours' time, her crew and their families will not see each other for three months. sadness. Um, he's been in for almost 14 years and you, 
You kind of get used to it, but then you don't. And then it'll probably hit me tonight that oh, I'm going to be by myself with these two. <laughs> Fortunately, I was home for every one of my children being born, but I was gone shortly after. And I'd, I'd leave home, and they might be a month old, and I'd come back, and they'd be four or five months old. And in some cases, you know, six, seven months old. That's just real hard, missing the, the children growing up. I lose my dad almost every year, and he's gone anywhere from a couple of weeks to six months. You know, other people talk about, well, I was with my dad and I did this, and I say, well, uh, my dad's at sea again. <laughs> so it's hard. that they go on. This time we, we took some lingerie of ours and uh, sprayed them with our perfume and put them in a little Ziploc bag and they're going to put it all over the, their boardroom and they're gonna, I guess they're going to try to guess who's is who's. And... The lingerie is going to come out just before they come home to remind them what they're coming home to. <laughs> <laughs> I think the perfume and the lingerie will do it. Leaving the family is really hard. An hour after the Georgia has pulled away from the wharf, she must pass through this floating bridge on her way to open sea and her patrol area. For wives and families, it's the last glimpse of the submarine with their men on board. And by tradition, some gather here for a final farewell.